Caesar's Palace is in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip. It's adorned with life-size Roman statues, pillars, fountains, and gold gilding. The casino is opulent. There's flashing lights in every direction, and beautiful people gliding between the one-armed bandits and the buzzing tables. The oxygen is intoxicating, and winning bells are everywhere. You check in with yourself. Cleverly, you made a budget for your gambling excursion, and tonight's the last night, and you threw down a bill that wasn't in the plan, and it's gone, and remorse is right here. Then suddenly, like a beacon of salvation, you remember your savings account, and you think to yourself, what if tonight I play one more hand and win it all back? My luck is changing. In decision making, there's an important difference between drawing a logical conclusion and justifying an irrational one. And I'm here to discuss the very subtle nuances between the two and how to tell when your brain is tricking you into the latter. Could save you a lot of anguish and a lot of money. Overconfidence is one of those biases, one of those tricks that your brain plays on you. Overconfidence is when you convince yourself of a decision without weighing the, the probabilities of the outcome. I can guarantee you that casinos are not hugely profitable businesses because your odds of winning are good. Hindsight bias is another. Sure, we've all experienced the emotion that comes with loss, but the saying 2020 hindsight speaks perfectly to the bizarre illusion that we can control or predict an event. Let me explain. This past January, MetLife, a large US insurance company, made a surprise announcement that they were going to be postponing their earnings report and that due to an accounting shortfall, they'd have to set aside over $500 million. Immediately, the share price dropped more than 10%. That afternoon, I was speaking with an investor who was kicking himself for not selling the shares prior to the announcement. He lamented over the phone that he had considered doing so literally days before. Have you ever found yourself muttering, I knew that was going to happen? Once an event takes place, the outcome is obvious, and our bias is to be right about our conclusions. Hindsight bias can literally distort our recollection of an event and our reconstruction of it. This investor was taking some of the responsibility for the loss, or he wouldn't have been kicking himself. He couldn't have known that this event was going to be uh, taking place. And unfortunately, not only was he being subject to hindsight bias, there was something else at work. You see, the reason he didn't sell the shares when he was looking at the portfolio just a few days before is because he had purchased MetLife a few dollars higher than where it was trading, and he didn't want to sell at a loss. It's common. People rationalize that the price they paid for a stock is a relatively good proxy for its value. This phenomenon is called anchoring, and believing that the price you pay for a stock has any information about the future value of the company is completely baseless. Think of it this way. Apple shares are trading right now roughly around $178 US. This fellow in the glasses in the front row bought them at 182. The fellow I can see over here in a check shirt bought the shares at $162 earlier in the year. And the lady in the vest down there paid $62 for it quite some time ago. What price should the shares be sold at? You can't tell from this information. Using the price that you purchase a security ad as a proxy of when to sell the shares is a terrible idea, is completely baseless, and doesn't um, contribute to a, a sound decision about evaluating the merits of owning or disposing of a security. 
Over the last couple of decades, two scientists named Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman have been doing studies about all of these heuristics and biases that our brains come equipped with and how they can cause problems in decision making. They did an experiment on anchoring that was fascinating. They asked participants to spin a wheel that was rigged to land on either 10 or 65. And then they asked if they could estimate whether the number of African countries in the United Nations was higher or lower than the number that they landed on, and then for them to estimate what that number was. If you had landed on 65, you might have thought, gee, you know, that's probably too high of a number, and adjusted it lower. And for those who landed on 10, you might have thought, it's probably more than 10. I think it's going to be a little bit higher from that. The second question is more precise. You'd probably draw on your general knowledge, your experience, and some independent thinking. But I doubt anyone in this room would realize that the random number that they spun on the wheel will significantly impact your estimate. That's exactly what happened in the experiment. Those who had spun 65 came up with an average estimate of 45 African countries in the United Nations, while those who spun 10 estimated an average of 25. That's a 40% difference. There is no way that the number randomly spun on a wheel contributes any information about Africa or the United Nations, yet our brains irrationally and automatically incorporate this information into our estimates. Our brains use shortcuts every day. There's no other way that we could process the kind of information that we need to to harness a speeding car around a hairpin turn. It's this very efficient system that relies on present experiences over past experiences, relies on confidence when making quick judgments, is affected by the powerful motivation of loss aversion and regret, and disregards known details during decision making. Anchoring causes all kinds of problems in everyday life. Consider the last time that a sale price was so compelling you purchased something that you didn't need. Or consider somebody selling their home and not wanting to sell if the price is lower than what they bought it for, even if that's a fair price in today's market. Or somebody, consider a worker who is negotiating a new contract and is being asked to accept fewer vacation days. They'd be reluctant to accept the new contract even if the old contract was obsolete. Money is such a ubiquitous part of everyday life and simple enough to understand that we think that we should be able to manage it effectively. So why would somebody collect a vacation fund in a mason jar on top of their fridge while carrying 21% interest on their credit card debt? There's a widely held belief that the stock market is fairly priced. After all, it's absurd to think that somebody would sell something at a, value, at a price lower than its value or buy something for more than what it's worth. Yet every day, people make decisions to buy or sell securities or other items for prices higher or lower than their value and justify those reasons for, for doing so. Everyday folks, from pauper to financial expert, sell at the desperate bottom of the market live beyond their means, and speculate in get-rich-quick schemes. And for every irrational decision, there's a justification that goes along with it. Here is another ordinary way that our brains trick us. In the same way that the Grand Canyon was ebbed away one grain of sand at a time, the devaluation of money because of rising cost of goods impairs our ability to buy goods and services and it goes almost unnoticed. The rising price of tomatoes next year or the price of a condo in Cabo San Lucas the next time you want to escape a dreary Canadian winter isn't going to bring you to financial ruin. But given our excellent health care, the rising prices over retirement can be significant. At a measly 3% inflation rate over 40 years, 
$100 is whittled down to $29.57. Someone who thinks that they're being safe by investing in term deposits at a moderate, modest return isn't being very safe at all if their money can't be used to buy the things that they used to. It's also the reason, the lack of appreciation for inflation, why your Aunt Martha has given you $25 a year every birthday for the last 18 years. So the next time you're talking to Aunt Martha, let her know it's $42.50 now. <laughs> Even those of us who are acquainted with all the biases and heuristics that, it, that affect our behavior, we still get caught up in it. But here are some of the tricks that professionals use to help mitigate those effects. First thing, write stuff down. It is remarkable how blinding the emotions that come along with loss aversion and regret can cause our memory to fail us. Writing stuff down can help prevent you from exiting an investment strategy prematurely. And it's also an excellent platform to evaluate new information against earlier decisions. One great example is a written investment policy statement. It's a guideline for making decisions about your investment strategy during times of volatility when emotions run high. Number two, automate everything you can. A computerized monthly contribution to your savings plan won't suddenly pause and wonder if the stock market is going to change direction. It's also not going to forget to invest. Don't rely on your subjective judgment when automation is a far superior way to produce consistent results. Number three, stop checking your investments. Watching the frequent oscillations of price changes only generates emotion and increases the likelihood of unnecessary trading. Reduce the temptation of selling during uh, volatility and downturns in the market. And if you can't handle the volatility that sometimes comes with those kinds of investments, simply diversify that away as a better proxy of managing that than watching every price movement. And number four, if you have a weakness for chocolate, don't keep it in your bedside table. <laughs> Let me leave you with this. Randomly selecting six numbers out of a lottery of 49 has odds of 13,986,816 to 1. So the next time you carefully select your numbers, just remember your odds are no better than if a computer generates your ticket. Thank you. <laughs>